because we were talking about canonical transformations and their different uses. That's what we ended with last time. Part of that is strange momentum definitions. So I, I wanted to give a little bit about, you know, let's, let's call them strange, as in not just the usual mechanical definition of momentum and how it shows up and gets used to simplify things. So this is strange, as in unusual to us, momentum definitions. And what is there? The generalized momentum need not be equal to the mechanical momentum, sort of the basic thing. With And by the mechanical momentum, I mean the usual mass times the inertial velocity. So we don't, we don't need that to be the case. And one of the clearest examples is if you look at a charged particle in an electromagnetic field. So this is where you've got a particle. It's got a mass M and then a charge. Uh, yeah, it's kind of confusing since we're talking about Hamiltonians, but Q is usually used for the amount of charge. And it's got a position R. We also have that there's an electric field and a magnetic field. And I don't know how to represent these. They're, they're vector fields and they'll depend on, they could depend on position and also time. They're not always at right angles, but here's just a, you know, a sketch. So how does that charged particle move in this electromagnetic field? Well, with under Newton's law, you would say M times second derivative of R. So the acceleration equals the force. And the force, this is known as the Lorentz, not the Lorentz from nonlinear dynamics. This is Lorentz with a, with a TZ. And the Lorentz force is Q. So the overall charge comes out in front and then it's the electric field plus R dot or the velocity across the magnetic field, that kind of famous V cross B term. So that's how you, that's how you would get it sort of from a straightforward Newtonian mechanics way of looking at it. So this is called the Lorentz, the Lorentz force law. Lorentz is Dutch. There's something called the Lorentz center. I, I went to a, a workshop about uh, kind of the physics of fluid flows. We're going to go further and write the electric field and magnetic field in different ways. So the magnetic field, you can write it as coming from a vector potential. So this is the curl del cross A. So A is the vector potential. That's what it's called. And this is kind of an analogous to uh, a scalar potential that you get from a usual force that's conservative and comes from a potential energy, which the B field looks a lot. I mean, the, the electromagnetic field, the electric field looks a lot like. So the electric field, this looks like uh, the negative gradient. And then this is called the electric potential. Uh, it's grad of phi which is, could be a function of position and time, has to be a function of position, could be a function of time. And then there's also this weird term, the negative uh, partial derivative of that vector potential with respect to time. So phi is the electric, and I guess we could just remind ourselves that it's not a vector, it's a scalar, it's a scalar field. All right, then in the Lagrangian formalism, you can write Lagrange's equations and the way that we get Lagrange's, we pick the form of Lagrange's equations so that it'll, um, or we pick the form of the Lagrangian function so that Lagrange's equations look like the Lorentz force law. But we're also doing this as a stepping stone to get to what the Hamiltonian uh, definition of the momentum is. So the, write it this way, the Lagrangian function is going to be the kinetic energy, so one half m, the magnitude of the inertial velocity squared, and then another term, so minus q uh, phi times the velocity, so r dot, dotted with a. 
So that's kind of a weird term. And then when we get, when we write Lagrange's equations, which we could sort of write in this sort of shorthand way, d by dt partial L partial R dot, where we know this stands for, this is the three different equations, but we're sort of summarizing it as a vector. Lagrange's equations recovers the Lorentz force law. Now in the Hamiltonian formalism, we could use the Legendre transformation and get momentum and then construct the, the Hamiltonian. So in the Hamiltonian formalism, right, what's the first step that we do? We get the momentum, the generalized momentum, and we'll just call it P. And we'll write it this way, partial L. What we're writing, we're summarizing the three different scalar components as a vector. So this will be partial L, partial R dot. And now if you take that derivative, well, you get this first part that comes from the kinetic energy. And so that's just gonna give us M R dot. That makes sense. But then there's also dependence on R dot over here. And that's the strange part. So we've got a minus and a minus. You take the partial derivative, you're going to get plus the charge times the vector potential. So that is a bit odd. So we have this term, which is the mechanical momentum, right? Mass times inertial velocity. And then we have this other term that for lack of uh, any other way to put it, we would just say this is the magnetic term because it comes from that magnetic vector potential. But at least in the Hamiltonian formalism, this is a legitimate way to write the uh, uh, momentum. It's a, it's a generalized momentum. And what do we require of this? Well, we're gonna, if we write the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian is gonna be, we'll write it this way the p vector dotted with the r dot vector minus l. And remember, we have to be able to write r dot completely in terms of the momentum. So we can do that. That's pretty easy over here. r dot equals uh, p minus qa, and then just divided by m. And then what do we get for the Hamiltonian? This is gonna be one over two m, this is what we'll end up getting. It's kind of weird. P, this, this defined generalized momentum, P minus QA at magnitude squared plus Q phi. So that's the Hamiltonian. And we got this weird, strange definition of momentum, but it works. Uh, there's, there's other, I guess, more pedestrian ways in which you get this, a kind of weird definition of momentum. And so the three body problem is a good example. So this is more in general, this is motion viewed in a rotating frame, which is key to kind of simplifying the equations of motion for the three body problem. And I mean the circular restricted three body problem. Right, so you've got a mass M2 and another mass M1, and they are moving about their Barry center with a certain rate. So we might try to just draw the line connecting them. So they're orbiting with some angular frequency omega about their common center of mass. And we're looking at what is the motion of a particle P. And if we were to look at this in an inertial frame, so maybe I will, maybe I'll move where this point P is somewhere out of the way over here. Um, if we had an inertial frame and then inertial coordinates, so maybe I'll call this capital X and capital Y. To get at the motion of the point P, you have to track the distance to each of the masses. And each of the masses is actually moving in a circle about that center of mass. 
So you're going to have some time dependent positions. It'd be a lot easier if you just sort of looked in the rotating frame. So that's what we tend to do. We take this line connecting M1 and M2, and we define that as a new coordinate. So we look at, um, let me call this X, little x, and then perpendicular to that, little y. And we look in that rotating frame. So we'd rather, it, it simplifies things because then we lose the time dependence of these positions, the distance to each of these. And that whenever you can get rid of time dependence, you should. In this case, it's going in, into a rotating frame. And the transformation from the inertial to the rotating frame, you could write this way. So that's cosine omega t, sine omega t, negative sine omega t, cosine omega t. And if you take time derivatives, which you could do, then you'll get something. So x dot, y dot equals what? We'll get this same rotation matrix times a uh, little x dot minus omega y, and then little y dot plus omega x. Now, what is the kinetic energy? And this is something that can at first seem confusing. We can just, we can simply write down the Lagrangian. What would the Lagrangian be? The Lagrangian being T minus V for this uh, particle. Let's give that particle, let's say it's got a mass M sub P. So the kinetic energy would be one half M sub P, um, what? Capital X dot squared plus capital Y dot squared. That's the kinetic energy. And then minus, we'll just leave the potential sort of general right now. It's gonna be a function of the position, but also time because M1 and M2 are moving around. But if we go into a rotating frame, we can get rid of that time dependence. And that's what we want. The way you do that is you just simply substitute in. So we'll write this kinetic energy for the particle, uh, but substitute in what X dot squared and Y dot squared is using this formula. If you do that, this rotation doesn't contribute anything. What you'll be left with is, uh, let me put this square brackets, little x dot squared, now little x dot, sorry, minus omega y squared plus y dot plus omega x squared. We just directly substitute in, we're writing the kinetic energy viewed from the inertial frame, but writing in terms of rotating frame um, coordinates, and that works, that's fine, you can do that. And one of the benefits is that this, uh, when you look in the rotating frame, so now we're looking completely in the rotating frame. Let me draw M2, M1. Here's the uh, little x, little y, a particle p. The, the potential um, energy at the point p due to the gravitational attraction of both bodies is uh, we lose time dependence. So now it's a potential energy that doesn't depend on time. What's my main point here is now when you, if you were to take the momentum P sub X, then what do you get? So this would be like partial R, partial little X dot, not big X dot, little X dot. And you'll get M times X dot minus omega y. So again, same kind of thing like we had for the particle in the electric and magnetic fields. So it seems, although I, I wouldn't interpret this thing as the mechanical uh, momentum because we're in a rotating frame. The whole thing is actually still mechanical momentum. Things just look weirder now. So yeah, we're, we're used to P looking like MV, but that's not always the case. It's not even always useful. So you know, sim something similar could be written for PY. Another case where this is useful, and this one is uh, pretty weird. 
got a particle in a force field where F looks like negative K Q. So I'm using Q as my generalized coordinate. Well, that just looks like a restoring force. But suppose I add on a one over the distance cubed term. Now this looks like it's gonna be pretty complicated, but it's not really. You could actually write a Hamiltonian for this, right? So F, if, there, if we wrote F equals MA, this would be M Q double dot equals F, where F is that thing, minus KQ minus alpha over Q to the cube. So good luck solving that, it looks really nonlinear. But then this is part of the magic of the Hamiltonian world is if you can find a good canonical transformation, you could simplify this. First, we need to write it in a Hamiltonian form. The Hamiltonian for this, one over two M P squared, that looks, that looks like a kinetic energy term, plus right, one over two K Q squared. That looks like what you get for the restoring force, like a spring or something. And then something weird, square root alpha over M times P over Q. Now that looks really weird, but Hamilton's canonical equations for this Hamiltonian recovers this up, up here. And I guess I'll just leave that as an exercise. It just, it just is that. Well, I guess we could, we could write it. Let's just do it. So Q dot, right, is partial H partial P. So this will give us P over M. Okay, that looks normal because then P equals Q dot times M. So that looks like the mechanical momentum, but there's P dependence elsewhere in this final term. So what do we get? We get plus square root alpha M or M one over Q. So yeah, that is, that is kind of weird. It means that, what, let me move this over. P over M equals Q dot minus alpha over M one over Q. Let's just move the M over M minus M. So we've got this mechanical momentum and then what? I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's just something. And then P dot equals minus partial H partial Q. So what do we get from that? We get minus K Q minus square root alpha over M P over Q squared. Put everything together and after a little bit of algebra, put it all together, we recover uh, Newton's equations. So why did we, why? Why would you do, why would you put yourself through this? Here's why. Because I could do a canonical transformation of this Hamiltonian that puts it in a really nice form. You're like, well, what do you mean really nice? Well, one of the really nice forms we've looked at before was if you can do a transformation to say new variables Q and P where the Hamiltonian is just equal to omega times P, well, then it's like uh, you've eliminated dependence on Q and this is really simple. It, your system looks like a simple harmonic oscillator because we were able to take the simple harmonic oscillator and make it look like this. My claim is there is some canonical transformation that does this. So you can use a canonical transformation, little q and p to a big q and p, and this is it. Q is uh, arc tangent of square root K times M times Q over P. And then P is uh, also pretty weird. One half P squared over square root K times M plus square root K times M Q squared plus alpha over K PQ. And if you do the substitution, you can find that this makes the above Hamiltonian into, um, I guess we would say H equals square root K over M 
times P. So if we just sort of define omega to be square root K over M, then we have a Hamiltonian that it's not a function of, it should be a function of Q, but it's not. So we get, we get that. And then the solutions are really simple, right? Q dot equals partial H partial P equals omega, a constant and P dot negative partial H partial Q. It's like we've turned Q into an ignorable coordinate. And so this is just zero. So the flow is pretty easy to solve. Things are just increasing with constant rate in capital Q and not changing at all in capital P. And yeah, okay, we have to deal with the fact that we've got some kind of weird momentum. So it, it could be the case. I don't know. You might say, well, where did you come up with this canonical transformation? It was an exercise in a book. Okay. I, it's not like I came up with it. Um, maybe it's possible that any nonlinear Hamiltonian, there is some transformation out there that makes it look nice, but then, yeah, you've got to deal with momenta and coordinates that are hard to interpret. First of all, this P is hard to interpret because it's mechanical momentum plus something else has to have units of mechanical momentum for everything. Units have to be homogeneous. Then when we do this transformation to the new big Q and big P, totally unclear what these things mean. Um, but then we could get solutions pretty easily and then we could transform back. Just remember that, you know, you take the thing that's hard to solve, transform to something easy, and then that whole approach that we mentioned in an earlier lecture. All right, with that out of the way, now we're going to talk about the uh, kind of canonical transformation-ness or we'll say symplecticness of the Hamiltonian vector field and the flow map. So I'm gonna call this symplecticness. It might not be a word. If you're writing a word doc, it's gonna un underline it. You just have to say, that's a word. Hamiltonian vector field and flow map. First we'll deal with the, the vector field. Um, and maybe I could, you can think of it this way. Suppose I just had a vector field. You don't know where it came from. So here's like a random vector field. Maybe it's hard to see, but that, that is a bunch of arrows. It's a vector field. They all seem to be about the same length. So that seems kind of odd, but hopefully at this point, it's clear that, right, we've got a vector field. When you have a vector field, kind of generally, we write it this way, if it, did, if it doesn't depend on time. So x dot is f of x. So at each point, there's a vector. So this is very general. N is the dimension of the phase space. We're just saying this is happening in Rn. So if we wanted to ask, all right, are these equations in canonical Hamiltonian form? Or equivalently, is this vector field of Hamiltonian vector field? Well, I guess given what we know, N has to be even. So this thing on the right, it's, it's odd. It's uh, three-dimensional. So first of all, N has to be even, you know, for every um, QI, you need a kind of conjugate momenta. That's for having a, I guess we could say a canonical Hamiltonian vector field, which, which sort of foreshadows, maybe you could have a non-canonical Hamiltonian vector field. Yeah, you can. But let's start, you know, we're just looking at canonical. So N has to be even, so if it's not even, okay, it's not. Uh, incompressibility of N volumes. So if we look at the divergence, if you calculate the divergence and that equals zero, that's sufficient actually for N equals two. I think for, if you have that, then you could always like construct a stream function or Hamiltonian that'll, that'll work. But this won't work for N uh, greater than or equal to four. Uh, what do we know about vector fields that are in 
canonical Hamiltonian form? Well, we've said, we've used this X notation, said, well, if we can write things this way, where J is the canonical symplectic matrix, and then DH just means the gradient of H. If we have something that looks like this, this is in canonical Hamiltonian form. So basically the question is, is F of X equal to JDH for some H? Is F of X equal to JDH of X for some H? Let's assume this is the case and from it we'll get some conditions on F. So we'll take the Jacobian of F so that's going to be a n by n matrix. Jacobian of f, so df equals, um, we're assuming this, so we would have, you know, j is a constant matrix, so you can't differentiate that. You'd have j d of d h x. This is j times, this weird notation, two derivatives oops, of H. But so don't be thrown off by what this is. This is just, we'll call this S. This is just the Hessian matrix of H. So it's the square matrix of the mixed partial derivatives of H. If you remember your multivariable calculus square matrix of mixed partial derivatives of the scalar H. So if we have, if we have that um, S, we could look at the elements of S. So this is something that's true for Hessians, Hessian matrices. They are square, right? Because of the equality of mixed partial derivatives. So this is the same as SJI, right? So S transpose equals S. S is a symmetric matrix due to the equality of mixed partials. And we could rewrite this as S transpose minus S equals the matrix of zeros. That's the condition that we're gonna use because we know um, from up here, we can write what is S in terms of the Jacobian of F, right? We've got from up here, DF equals JS. So now rewrite this so that S is on one side, just multiply both sides by negative J. Remember the property of J, J times itself equals negative the identity. So we could rewrite this S equals negative J, the Jacobian of F. So if we plug this into this boxed equation over here, um, what we'll end up getting is df transpose j plus j df equals zero. So this is a condition for the vector field at each point. f of x at each point x for it to be a Hamiltonian vector field. And we would say that, um, well, this is, this is often called the infinitesimally symplectic condition. Just rolls off the tongue. Infinitesimally symplectic condition. Uh, as a matrix, right, DF, at each point is just a matrix. Then what is this? This is just A transpose J plus J A equals zero. If you have a matrix that satisfies that, we say it's an infinitesimally, infinitesimally symplectic matrix. So a matrix A that satisfies that is infinitesimally symplectic. It, the, another term would be sometimes some, the word symplectic and canonical 
get used synonymously. So this is sometimes in some books called uh, infinitesimally canonical matrix. Same thing. Now this, this is a condition that has to hold at all points in the space. So if I just sort of scoot up here and you get this visual of a point where, or you know, there's a, vectors are everywhere. What about at equilibrium points? If you have equilibrium points, this condition still holds. And so this is just sort of a special application. If we have an equilibrium point and I'll call that equilibrium point X bar, uh, this condition still holds. So if, if we have the A, and that's defined as the, diff, the, the Jacobian matrix at that point, right? This is what you would do if you were to do linearization at the equilibrium and find out uh, what are the dynamics near an equilibrium. You would, you would calculate this matrix, right? This is from linearization of the dynamics if you wanna like the first step in understanding the dynamics near a point is you calculate this matrix A and then get its eigenvalues. And for most uh, systems, A, the, the matrix A could be uh, anything, which just, it's usually just, it's real. And being real means it, there's some conditions on it. But now we have this additional condition and this will have some implications. So being, an infinitesimally symplectic matrix uh, has implications for the, I, the, the type of eigenvalue spectrum you can get. And let me just show over here, suppose N equals uh, four, then what are the eigenvalues? Here's a possibility for the eigenvalues. We usually write the real, in the imaginary. So we're looking at the complex plane. Uh, if I have an, un, I'll write the eigenvalue as an X. So here's Lambda. Just being a real matrix means that this has to have a Lambda bar. That also has to be an eigenvalue just because A is real. Now, because of this condition up here, the infinitesimal symplectic condition, and you can, I'm not going to prove this, but it can be proven in one of the references is probably pretty good. Um, so not only is if, if lambda is an eigenvalue, do you get lambda bar, but you also get that negative lambda is an eigenvalue. So negative lambda, you can, you, you can flip, uh, you reflect about the origin. And if negative lambda is an eigenvalue, then again, because the matrix is real, uh, it means that negative lambda bar. So you get what's called a quartet of eigenvalues, Hamiltonian quartet. So this can happen. I haven't seen it happen much. What I tend to see, like this is the, if you look at the circular planar restricted three-body problem, look for, uh, look at the fixed points the equilibrium points L1 or L2, then what will we get for uh, eigenvalues? If it's planar, so we've got just N equals four because we got two degrees of freedom. And for those, we have that there is a real set of eigenvalues, right? If you're on the, the real axis, right? Because there's, a, because there's a lambda, we'll call this lambda one, maybe here's negative lambda one. It's also real. And there is a completely um, imaginary eigenvalue, which has a completely imaginary complex conjugate. This is called a saddle center because you've got saddle directions given by these and then center directions. So this is a saddle center. And you know these things depend on uh, the spectrum of eigenvalues. It depends on parameters, most likely. So as you change parameters, the eigenvalues can't just do anything. They're constrained by being 
uh, coming from an infinitesimally symplectic matrix. So you could also have that you've got two saddle directions or something, two saddle projections. You could have everything on the real axis or everything on the imaginary axis. This is the kind of interesting one. It's got center directions which want to oscillate and then saddle directions where there's a direction going out, that would be this one, and directions where things are coming in. And it exactly will preserve the four-dimensional phase space volume. So that's, that's kind of cool. So that's the infinitesimal symplectic matrix. So that's looking at the symplecticness of the vector field. Now, when we talk about solutions, solutions are when you look at initial conditions and follow them forward. And that's flow maps, which I may have mentioned before, but I'll now mention them again. Right, flow maps would be, in general, these are solutions to x dot equals f of x. In fact, this is what, when you just use a Runga Kutta solver, this is what it does. It gives you the flow map, right? You have an initial condition like x naught, and you want to know where it goes. So in the phase space, x naught is followed forward in time, often with you know small time steps or something if you're doing Runga Kutta. And then it takes you, says where this is after some elapsed time. So let's say this was at some time t later, then this is x of t, right? That's just for one point, but it's useful to kind of look at a map that takes in points. So the, the flow map is the solution map. So we'd say x of t is, I'll write it this way, phi uh, sub t. It takes in the in initial condition, flows for a time t, and so then that tells you what where this point, where it has your point drifted to. And you could view phi of t, suppose you fix the value t, then we are taking points in our space. Let's say, uh, I didn't say it up here, we're looking in Rn. It takes points in Rn or even entire open sets in Rn if you want and maps them to other points in Rn. So the flow map, phi t solves the ODE, solves that ODE. But then it's useful to think of it as this you know, separate mathematical object. What if I flow for a time zero? This is something to note. If I flow for a time zero, phi of zero means the identity. Nothing happens. Uh, if you want to be fancy, phi of t is a one is a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms. The one parameter is the time t. So let's say I fix the time t, then if you imagine a grid, it'll deform the grid. If I increase the time t, suppose we start with a regular grid points, it'll deform. In fact, there's a nice little video that I have that shows this. So we've got, uh, this vector field on the left, and it's going to deform this initially regular spaced grid on the right. We're increasing time, and you see this deformation. In fact, this, you could tell from this, this is not a Hamiltonian flow because some regions are shrinking and some are not. If I show that again, right, uh, some regions are growing, some are not. This is just the operation of this static vector field here on the left, but it, it deforms. So flow maps for canonical Hamiltonian systems have a special structure. And we sort of hinted at that when we talked about um, looking at over very small time uh, time step dt, we showed that, well, solutions to the canonical Hamiltonian systems are themselves canonical transformations. So in addition to these things, phi of t being diffeomorphisms uh, for x dot equals j d h x, so a special form of our differential equations, the flow maps phi of t 
are canonical transformations. So not only are they diffeomorphisms, they are canonical transformations. They're sometimes called simplectomorphisms. And that's true for any time t. So the things have to deform continuously in such a way that the solution map is itself a canonical transformation. And that is pretty cool. So I'm gonna just run through uh, a couple of examples and then I think that'll, that'll be it. Uh, before I do those, are there questions? Um, for yeah. the saddle centers, I'm assuming they're not the same thing as saddle points. They are, yeah, they could be saddle points. Yeah, like if we just had a two-dimensional Hamiltonian system, we wouldn't have these blue ones that are on the imaginary axis. We just have the uh, a positive eigenvalue and then it's exact negative and that would be a center point. So saddle, we call it a saddle center if it's in uh, four dimensions. So if, if you think of the point L1, like in its, the potential energy surface looks like a saddle, but that's just in two of the four phase space dimensions. So L1, uh, as a equilibrium point is a saddle center point. And sometimes people just abbreviate it and just say, ah, oh, it's a saddle point. Oh, that's interesting. There's also, I've worked with people in structural mechanics and they, they seem to have this, they don't really have the dynamic point of view sometimes. So they'll say like a beam that's unstable, like this card, I went to the dentist and it's my like reminder of go, go to the dentist again. Uh, if you look at the potential energy for the, the beam, it's got a, an unstable point. And they'd say, oh, that's a saddle point. And I would say, well, no, it's actually a saddle center. Because if you look at its dynamic directions, there's, there's, there's more going on. So kind of from the static uh, stability point of view, you could call it a saddle point. But in the dynamic saddle center is more appropriate. And something like L4 and L5, they just have two sets of purely imaginary eigenvalues. So those are called center centers. You could also have saddle saddles. You could also have all, all the eigenvalues equaling zero. And then uh, that's a problem. It means you can't, you don't know what the dynamics are from just the, the linearization. You actually have to do a nonlinear calculation. And that leads into something called center manifold theory. The pendulum, if we were to talk about the pendulum phase space, if I were to just sketch it, right, you've got things and then you've got these saddle points. And I guess we could draw things going the other way, but really these are the same point. The, the inverted position is a just a saddle point. If we looked at what the eigenvalue spectrum was there, we would have just a, a purely real and then the negative of, of that. Because it means things are kind of going off in the unstable direction with the exact same rate to be balanced by things coming in on the stable direction. So the inverted pendulum position is a, is a saddle point. And then this other one would be called a center point because it has purely imaginary eigenvalues. And so this picture of things that are centers seem to have uh, you know, periodic motion and things that are just saddles will have things coming in and going out then if you combine it, it's kind of hard to picture what's going on in four dimensions, but you have both these behaviors happening. You could actually uh, list all of the different possibilities. If you have n equals four, n equals six, n equals eight, right? It's only even numbered things. And you could discuss what are all the possible types of equilibrium points. And it, it's a finite list when you have a Hamiltonian system. And in fact, in, with n equals two, this is kind of it. You've got saddles or you have centers or you have both eigenvalues equaling zero. So it's like you have a multiplicity two eigenvalue zero. And then we don't know what that is. I'm not sure what that would even be called. I think it'd be called like a degenerate center or something. It's also a kind of a check on, have you done things right? If, you, uh, if you're getting a spectrum that's different from this and yet you should get something like that. Like if you have Lambda, you should have negative lambda as also an eigenvalue. And this, for this case, right, the ones on the imaginary axis, negative lambda is the same thing. 
So that's why you don't get any additional information. And I, I haven't seen quartets, even though they could theoretically happen. I haven't seen them in a, a problem yet. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're just not common in celestial mechanics, but they might be common somewhere else. All right. So I'm going to give some examples of flow maps for things that I can solve. So it's very limited. So let's look at some example flow maps. Simple harmonic oscillator is sort of a natural choice, right? So that's what we're going to look at. Simple harmonic oscillator in its usual kind of boring coordinates. And I'm going to scale it. Uh, so not that if, if you're thinking of the spring mass system, I'm going to scale it. So m equals one and omega equals one. So that means like I've made a choice of the units of mass and the units of time. So then the Hamiltonian looks really simple. It's just one half uh, q squared plus p squared. If I write it as you know, x is, uh, if I use the x notation, q and then p. Hamilton's equations are pretty easy. q equals p, p dot equals negative q. Uh, so this means q dot p dot equals, uh, what is this? Zero, one, negative one, zero. What do you know? It's the J matrix. That'll make our life easy. Um, in general, right, x, if x dot equals something, uh, just a matrix times x, we know how to solve that. Here, a equals j, which is 0, 1, negative 1, 0. The solution, general solution, you have this is x dot equals e to the a t uh, times the in initial condition. And here we have a equals j. So e to the a t equals is just by the definition of the exponential of a matrix, we have the identity plus a times t, but this is now uh, j. a times t plus one over two factorial t squared, a squared, uh, so what, one over three factorial, t cubed, a cubed, and so on. But what do we know about uh, a? Since a squared is j squared, this is negative the identity. And we could also work out what is a to the third. It's j times j squared. So it's negative j. And so it's looking like maybe we could group terms in a way that's, that's going to make sense. So this is um, the identity matrix. And then what's this next one? A times T is J times T. So that'll be zero T negative T. And then we've got this other thing, uh, which will be negative the identity times one over two T squared. So negative one half T squared, negative one half T squared and so on, what I'm going to get is if I start grouping these one minus one half T squared, et cetera, T plus stuff uh, down here, negative T plus stuff. And this is one minus one half T squared. If you, if you actually work out what those are, these are the Taylor series expansions for cosine T and sine T. So we could just write cosine t and sine t. So then this equals cosine t, sine t, negative sine t, and this is still cosine t. So this is the, I guess we could write this as capital R sub t. It's the clockwise rotation through an angle t. So we could, we can now write what the uh, flow map is, right? This is giving the flow map. This is the flow map. But now we've worked out what uh, A of T is. It's, it's R, E to the AT. So X T equals R, just a rotation times the initial condition written as a vector. 
So the flow map for any time, you take in an initial condition, and this just is, uh, it's an unusual case because it's a linear flow map. Typical flow maps are not linear, but that would be how you write the solution. And if you are if you want some help, uh, here's Q, here's P, and here is an initial vector. So this point, X naught, um, if we take that initial condition X naught and say, well, where does this go? You know, this goes to, so this is uh, Q naught, P naught. This will go to a new point and it doesn't change its direction or change its distance from the origin. It's pure rotation. So this is X time T is R T times X naught. Right, Q at T and P of T. If we were to explicitly write it, we get this, it's cosine T, sine T, negative sine T, cosine T times Q naught, P naught, just rotates it. Now here's something to notice. If we take the derivative with respect to X naught of the flow map, this is the derivative of this thing with respect to X naught. Well, this just gives us R. And we could notice something else. If we take this, um, do the transpose, then times J, you might, this might look familiar. I'm writing down the condition, trying to see if the flow map obeys the condition that we would expect for a canonical transformation. And so what is this going to be? This is going to be e to the j t transpose j e to the j t right because r is e to the j t because a, a equal j in this case so there's this if if you don't remember your uh, matrix algebra j this means that j times r is r times j so j and r commute J and R commuting means that you can rearrange the order of this matrix multiplication and you'll just get uh, that E to the JT and transpose and E to the JT will cancel out. E, this is E to the J transpose T. So this will just leave us with J, right? So V of T is a canonical transformation because this is true everywhere. If you remember what the uh, condition was for a canonical transformation, and I don't now have the subscript T, it was that if you take D phi, and we called that M before, M transpose J M equals J. Well, now we have something that has, that has to be satisfied for all times T and all initial conditions X naught. And indeed we have that satisfied. So we can show that the flow map for the was this simple harmonic oscillator is a canonical transformation. We also know you can do the change of variables. What if we did the other variables? So what if we did that nice change of variables? Remember Q, little Q and P going to big Q and P where the Hamiltonian is equal to, uh, I guess this would be omega is just equal to one. So this is just the Hamiltonian equals a new P. So Q dot equals one, P dot equals zero. What does that flow even look like? It's super easy. Uh, every point, I mean, the flow, it's like the flow is just unit direction going to the right. So the vector field just looks like that. So if you have a point somewhere in there, then it's going to just sort of drift to the right. In fact, if you have a whole region of points, so let me maybe color in a region, then that region will just drift. It won't deform or anything, and we'll have a new, uh, a new location. So this would be like D, the disk at time zero, and then now here's D, T. It is, you take that initial disk and flow it. And it's really just translation in the Q direction. So in the 
an original coordinates, it looked like um, rigid body rotation. And here doing this transformation, we make it look like translation. Of course, it's in this kind of abstract space. If we were to write out explicitly, what is the flow? If we start with an initial point, Q naught, P naught, this will go to Q naught plus T, P naught. We want this to be in a form where we could take its derivative. So we've got the identity matrix times Q naught, P naught plus, we only have translation in the Q direction. So if we were to take the derivative of this with respect to its sort of native variables, the initial conditions, we get an, the identity matrix. And so pretty trivially, if you put M equals the identity into here, it's satisfied. So phi of T is a canonical transformation. Now this isn't, it's not always this simple. I'll end with uh, another physical example of falling in uniform gravity, which is kind of cool. So what I mean is we've got some reference height and we've got gravity going down. We'll actually measure things so that Q is increasing going down. So we've got a particle of mass M and it's got some momentum that's only gonna be increasing going down. So Q is measured downward. Q is measured downward. So kinetic is one over two M P squared. We could just directly write that. Uh, potential energy, it's M G times the height, but because we're measuring Q downward, it's minus M G Q. So the Hamiltonian T plus V, the total energy, is uh, P squared over 2M minus MGQ. So Hamilton's equations, what do we get for this? Kind of the normal thing, P over M. P dot equals negative partial H partial Q equals MG. It's increasing. So we can, from sort of a first course in physics, you know how to solve this. So P, so function of time is P naught plus MGT. And then what about this Q as a function of time is Q naught plus P naught over M time plus uh, one half GT squared. And then it's useful to just sort of sketch, well, what would happen um, what does it look like in the phase space? And is this a canonical transformation? So phi of T, if we start with Q naught and P naught, right? This is just Q and P, but we've already explicitly written that. We're just gonna group terms so things look kind of interesting. So this will be what? One T over M, zero, one. This is Q naught, P naught plus some other terms that don't depend on the initial conditions. One half G T squared. They, they do depend on time, but not the initial conditions. M G T. So just based on this, we could take the derivative with respect to the initial conditions of this flow map, and we'll get this matrix. One T over M zero one. And you could verify, I won't do it, right? Uh, with, you know, with J equals zero, one, negative one, zero, that M transpose times J times M. If you work that out, you will indeed get that this is J. Uh, yeah, not, not check, but J. So it's a canonical transformation. And what does it look like if we were to sketch it? If I start, this is Q and this is P, and I'll look at a rectangle. Let's call this corner point A naught, and then over here, B naught, and then C naught, D naught. I'm just giving names to points so I could sketch this rectangle. We wanna know, okay, how does this rectangle deform? You could follow each of these paths and what will you see? So this is a region fancy D naught. All right, so follow each of these points. Where do they go? 
they'll go somewhere like take a a naught it'll map to some new point and so will this point they'll actually move in a parallel way so they'll be at kind of the same height p but there'll be a little bit of shear if we look at okay where does d not go to um it's going to go a little bit further same for c it's going to go a little bit further has to parallel what d does so this isn't the best drawing in the world but it does show okay this this thing will kind of this rectangle will shear and it's going to be a little bit squished. I didn't quite represent it super well. So this is the region D after some time T and the parallelogram. Parallelogram DT has the same area as D not because that's one of the properties of a canonical transformation in 2D. I think that's, that's it. We'll talk about the uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation next time, which is a systematic way of finding the best canonical transformation. It's a time-dependent change of variables that makes your new Hamiltonian equal to zero so that every point is an equilibrium point. It's kind of this weird trick, but we'll talk about that next time. So that's it.